Okay, welcome to lecture five. Let's get the class started with the quiz as always. So as I have told you last week, we'll start taking the attendance starting this week. And you have uh, two, basically no penalty missing classes. So after missing two classes, your um, score will be, your attendance score will be deducted 1% for every class missed up to um, 10%. That's for, um, yeah, actually regular students and for neighbor students, I'll actually tell you soon. Um, we actually have, we'll have to take attendance. So for now, if you're here, please make sure to take the quiz. I'll uh, upload the quiz right now. And yeah, as I've said, the attendance will be checked by whether you participated in the quiz, not whether you got the question correct or anything else. So even if you have no idea, just make sure to you do participate in this quiz. So I'm making the question now. So I just launched it. You have three minutes.
Okay, so the three minutes up, but I'll leave the poll open until the until we check the answers. Until 4.10, basically. So let's go with the announcements first. Okay, so assignment one is out, was out last Wednesday, and it's due in two weeks from this Wednesday. So I gave you three weeks for just this time because of the, um, we have uh, Thanksgiving next week. It's pretty long holiday. So yeah, we I gave you one more week to complete it, but um, in general, you'll have two weeks to complete it. And we will start taking attendance today. So please make sure to participate in the quiz. I'm gonna just send the result. The uh, I can download the results. Well, basically I don't really care about the answers, but I'm gonna send the results to Hattie and the Hattie will mark the attendance based on the who participate in the poll. And also please feel, uh, yeah, it's not feel, it's please actually it's, um, Please let our TA know if you have to miss the class. I know there is a, a school computing colloquium going on at 4 p.m. Monday. So if there is a, a colloquium thing, uh, a lecture that you want to attend, then it's, it's fine. So just uh, let uh, TA know and you will, be, you will not be deducted. Your uh, attendance score will not be deducted. And um, for neighbor students, so there will be a change of a participation grading policy because um, neighbor, I just talked with uh, neighbor and then the neighbor requires me to actually take attendance as well. So previously it was that all the, the participation was coming from discussion, right? But then now actually it will come from both attendance and discussion, but um, basically it's about half the load of regular students in a sense that for the attendance, you are allowed to miss up to seven classes and then after missing seven classes um, for, so basically if you miss 10 classes, then 10 minus seven and three. So you will have 3% deducted from your, for your attendance. So which will be 2%. Well, 2% out of 50%. So basically 4% of your grade, right? Uh, I think percent is a bit difficult to, um, I mean, it's a bit confusing. So you can think of this as more of just uh, points. It's out of 50 points, by the way for neighbor students. And it's out of 100 points for regular Kai students. And discussion. So I think initially said that the entire 10, the 10 points participation grades are coming from the discussions. But then now instead, I will just uh, require you to just only participate in one of those. We'll have two throughout the, um, the semester. And also, I removed the final project option Sorry about the uh, changing this, but I thought about it and it would be very weird for you to take the class and still don't do any assignments. So I'm requiring you to actually complete uh, two assignments of your choice, which this was the option you had initially, but there is no final project option. So you don't have to do any final project. Um, sorry about the change. And there is one thing, um, this, so I actually, change the wording of was assignment one problem 3.2 a bit. I wanted to clarify a bit. I'm going to talk about this soon because I'm going to go over the assignment in today's class. But basically the point I want to make is that 3.2, maybe it wasn't clear that you have to implement on RNN with 10H activation and also use the last time steps hidden state for the classification. So we're going to go for a really quick recap. Actually, before that, do you have any question? Please uh, ask me now. Okay, so if you have any question, please interrupt me anytime, please. Okay, so we're gonna go for really quick lecture four recap because we didn't discuss that much actually. So, um, so we talked about tokenization, which is just trying to split the sentence into categorizable units because you, you cannot categorize text. So you instead categorize the units of a text. And that's very similar to words in general, but we call it token just for um, um, general purpose. 
thing. And uh, we saw that a simple tokenization will be uh, basically space splitting. So for instance, this will be, uh, this isn't a fantastic movie, but rather semi-good. And this isn't perfect because sometimes we want to separate between, for instance, movie and comma, but this will not be separated if you just split by space. So you, you will need some regular expressions to have a special handling of these punctuations. And also, you might want to also separate between is and not, because NT is basically shorthand for not, right? So you might want to separate is and this NT and apostrophe T, which is shorthand for not. You might also want to separate with the, this, um, this hyphen, right? So because of that, tokenization can be as simple as just space splitting, or it can be as complex as really uh, long regular expressions. But whichever it is, you will need to first construct vocab. And vocab can be constructed in two ways, which one is that you use a pre-built dictionary, maybe uh, Oxford dictionary. You can just, uh, these are the what the experts created, or you can try to build a vocab using your own training data. And this is what we're gonna be doing in your assignment. And I think it's quite simple that you just, if you do space split, then you can just construct your uh, vocab by just defining a set of all the words, right? And there are different types of tokenizers, Y space based, easy, but sometimes not super effective. Vocab based, this is, uh, uh, you can basically, given the vocab, you can choose token in the vocab that match the next characters. So I will be, actually, I wanna just clarify that. So this is, uh, I talk about BPE here. Actually, I think next slide, right? And then, so I, I this, there was a, I would say a little, uh, there was an error saying that this is how the original BP worked. So to be more exact, there are several variants of BP and one of the variants is a uh, sentence piece. And sentence piece considers the entire sentence as uh, one um, text sequence and then tries to find in, uh, the best token, you know, that matches the vocab, longest token basically. And that's a bit different from actually what the BP was originally or uh, very similar to word piece. So I'm gonna go into that probably next lecture, not today because we have to, we'll, I have to cover RNNs for the uh, assignment today. But for now, you can think of it as uh, there are several variants of BPs and um, it's really not super clear sometimes when you say BP, which BP you're referring to, but the core idea is quite similar. So, and then you can use more complex tokenizers which use regular expressions, vocab and linguistic rules such as like a MATCAP, NLTK. But the trend is that we are moving towards more of a vocab based and also more of a data driven tokenizers, subword based basically with BP. And uh, by pair encoding, basically what it does is that you're given this long sequence and then you basically try to find most common pairs iteratively so that you can define your token to be most, basically most frequent patterns instead of a based on some dictionary that humans built. And also we talked about one of the uh, tricky things about RNNs is that the length, input length can be very, very, very a lot. And this actually was historically or a more traditionally very difficult problem to handle or I mean not trivial problem to handle, but then people have found that in general, it's easier, not only easier to code, but also it doesn't really affect the performance even if you just consider input length to be fixed. So basically you just uh, define a length that's not too small, that's not too big, say 128 for instance, or 256. And then if the text is shorter than that, just pad. And if it's longer then just truncate, whatever it's in excess, then you can always make your input to the fixed length. And then it usually fits your need in many cases. And if it's, um, especially te text classification. If it's something more complicated, as you will see soon, then we can have some tricks based on this um, fixed length and truncate or pad technique. 
Okay, and then we saw that, then basically now we are ready for creating a neural networks for text classification because we have things fixed input length with one hot vectors. And I told you that the, the first layer can be considered as word embedding. And we usually don't put, don't put the uh, activation on top of this word embedding or this first layer because anyways, we're not really doing any linear transformation. And we, we saw why is the case in our last lecture, right? And we also do not call this a layer uh, for just convention, and they're just called word embedding. Okay, so we actually saw an example. Probably don't have time for this today, but uh, hopefully you, there is a YouTube video for um, our last lecture, so please go to that. So now let's go come back to our quiz. I'm gonna stop the poll. This looks like most people answered it. I'm gonna end the poll. I will first save this just in case I miss it. Just a second. Okay, just saved. I'm gonna share the results. Okay, so question one, 72% false, 20% true. What's the answer? The answer, answer is false. Why? Because I said that word embedding doesn't include activation function. It's a bit of tricky trick question. Number two, true or false, it is common to include Onk token, which stands for unknown in the vocab to handle unseen words. Yes, this is true because Onk token is very, it's actually quite useful and also very necessary. And number three, true or false, in order to handle variable length text input, one first determines if a fixed, a fixed input length and truncate if the input is shorter and pad if the input is longer. This was also a trick question because actually you uh, pad if you, your input is shorter and you actually truncate if the input is longer, right? The other way, so it's false. So false, true, false. And looks like at least more than half people got correct for each question, so that's great. Okay, so nice. All right, so let's go into today's lecture. Okay, so um, we just ended the previous lecture with a neural network that uh, after we fix the length and the input length, we can create a neural networks, uh, basically multi-layer perceptron on top of these inputs, right? Because how does that work? Well, you have, uh, um, for instance, inputs, right? And for each input, you have a one hot token. something like that, maybe zero, 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 one. And these one hot tokens can be just concatenated to create a matrix, right? And then you basically have a first layer, which is basically word embedding layer. And then you can put uh, linear layers on top of these word embedding layers to create a, some classifier, right? But then there's one critical issue with this, this real network, which is that this cannot handle sequential dependency. Well, to be more exact, it's not that it cannot handle, but then, well, because it's it's actually possible if you have really long, really large number of layers, then you at, at some point you will actually um, have some sequential dependency. But it's clear that if we have just one or two layers, then this lacks sequential dependency because you just apply something uh, just linear on top of the all these inputs, right? But what we, we really want in general is that when we are modeling xt or the whatever at the time step t, we want to make sure that 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 output is actually dependent on every token that happens before that, right? So what that means is. Well, we're gonna see what that means soon with using RNNs, but the point I wanted to make here is that just using this 
MLP with the one or two layers is very limited because you will not be able to model. Uh, okay, so yeah, let, tell, uh, please let uh, Miyoung know, our Hattie, uh, regarding you forgot to click the submit button. So these things you, you can always um, please let the uh, let our TA know. Okay. And, and why is this sequential dependence important? Because your, the meaning of a word actually often depends on whatever is around it, maybe before or after. So for instance, I have two sentences, the Q2 earning report of Apple showed that. And I have a second sentence, I ate an Apple today. So it's pretty clear that the apple in the first sentence actually means the company apple, but then in the second sentence, probably this means the apple that you eat. So why, how do I know that? Because, well, I'm pretty sure that the, the fruit apple will not have any earning report, right? And in the second sentence, it's pretty also clear that you cannot really eat a company. So this sequential dependency is very important. And this neural net multi-layer perceptron is not able to really actually, it's not, not it's not, it's not, not only MLP uh, is it unable to hand, uh, model the sequential, sequential dependency, but also we haven't put any inductive bias into this that encourages it to model such sequential dependency. So these two are diff two different things. It's really important to notice the difference. If you stack a lot of MLP layers, then you might actually be able to model sequential dependency. Why? Because um, probably we're, we're gonna actually skip that for now, but then I can tell you for now that you can actually model, model it, but still it's not gonna be a, a strong inductive bias. And researchers have tried to put this inductive bias into the model, such so sequential dependency for a long time. And well, the spoiler is that apparently we can use RNNs to inject such inductive bias. And spoiler number two is that, so, okay, are the RNNs really important? Or in other words, so are we using RNNs these days? And the answer is that we, in some cases we're using them, but we are, in most cases, we are actually not using it. We will get to that soon. So we'll come back to that. But for now, think of this as something, I would say it's a bit of a legacy, uh, a bit of a, I would say history than the state of the art, but still it's very important to know, I think, because that actually gives you the motivation of the, the recent technology where what I'm talking about here is actually transformer and basically learning about RNNs motivates why Transformer was designed four years ago. Okay, but yeah, but we will talk about RNNs, okay? So what is RNN? So it's actually very simple. So in RNNs, you basically apply the same linear transformation on your inputs across time, not across the layers, I mean, the layers being the hierarchical layers, the depth, but then yourself, the input it, it, to it, input itself. So X here is a sentence that consists of uh, several words. So XT is a teeth word. So basically X can be something like, for instance, uh, X1, X2, X3, where X1 is maybe I, X2 is M, and X3 is Sam, right? And then, you basically apply the recurrent relationship to itself iteratively, which is basically if you unfold it, you're applying the same weight. So here, um, when I'm saying weight, I'm talking about linear transformation and you apply the linear transformation V to it itself. And always when the input comes in, you apply the, this linear trans transformation U and also you apply 
uh, W at the output side. Of course, um, so U and W are actually optional. So I'm not gonna actually uh, put this here for now. Well, well, because actually I'll actually put it because um, it, it depends on how you define X, right? So if you if you define your X to be one hot vector, then what will be the U equivalent to here? Then your U will be basically just word embeddings, right? Because you apply a single linear transformation and that's just word embedding. We, we talked about it. But what if X, X, you define X to be actually the output of the word embedding? Well, well in that case then, um, do you really need U? Well, maybe, or maybe not. So it depends, right? But if you are using one hot vector, then you will need U. If you're using actually output of word embedding, and if your word, word, embedding, word embedding's dimension is equivalent to the, um, the V, then, well, not V, I'm sorry, the hidden state, then maybe you don't need to. Okay, is that clear? But uh, I'll just define the relationship to be here. So what is HT? HT is simply, so hidden state at time step here. So I'm talking about this one. Um, is just so simply you multiply the previous hidden state t minus one with v, so it will be v times h t minus one plus you multiply u to the input, and you can put bias sometimes bias vector or not. It, I'll just skip it for now because adding a bias is very uh, just uh, something you can do anytime. It's usually not shown in the diagram as well. Well, and then, of course, if you're doing classification, then you might want to linear map this into your number of classes, right? And what, what that will be basically translate into the probabilistic distribution of the output classes. So then in that case, well, your HT will be, well, that's HT, I'm sorry. And your output will be just W times HT. Right, so that's what this is talking about. And that's very simple, right? Because you just apply V iteratively and apply U for the every input. And this way, now you see that there is at least some linear relationship between, not linear actually, sequential dependency between HT and every word that comes before HT. So HT depends on H1 to what? HT minus one. And of course, what that means also is that they also depend on X1 to XT minus one. Do you agree with this? The fact that HT depends on all these inputs? Well, because um, this flow through like that, this will flow through like that, everything flows through the uh, recurrent relationship to HT. So this is what I exact what I meant by recurrent neural network is able to model sequential dependency. And in other words, recurrent neural network is injecting inductive bias into the model so that it can model the sequential dependency of the input. Of course, the new direction though, right? It cannot model what's happening after XT. Clear? But there are actually, um, I would say, well, many problems, but I'm gonna talk about two problems. Number one is that multiplying the same matrix over and over again will result in exploding values. So why is that so? So I can actually prove this very easily. So I show you that HT equal to what? V of HT minus one plus U of XT. So, and that means what? Let me just expand on HT minus one. And that will be what? HT minus one will be just V of HT minus two plus U of XT minus one and U of XT. So if you just do, you know, this over and over again, what that will be is that, well, you'll go up to V of uh, H of one. And how will I um, actually put this? So, 
Well, you, you're going to actually, well, H of zero, I'm sorry. So H, we, we're going to actually define H zero to be, um, because you will have something, you will have to have some vector that goes into the first hidden state or the previous hidden state. You usually define that to be zero vector. So you call it H zero. And usually just as a zero vector. Then you will have to go up to uh, A zero, which is just um, zero vector. So if you multiply anything to zero vector, then that'll be just zero vector. So what this will be is HT will be equal, uh, equal to you multiply V T minus one times to itself. And then, well, that gets multiplied to U of uh, X one, right? And then you have a V of a T minus two u of x2 and so on until u of just x t without any uh, v and the problem is that this thing v t minus one this is basically you're multiplying by itself and if well this is of course matrix so it's uh, it's not exactly scale value but let's say v uh, but it's very similar to scale value if you talk about just the diagonal values, right? And what that means is that um, if this V value, the, the, the values in V is very big, what happens? Well, if let's say this V was something like, um, just, um, I would say, just for, just for the easiness, let's say this was identity matrix with 2.0 times identity matrix, just for the uh, sake of, easy computation. So INT matrix is just one, 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 and zero, right? And then V over T minus one is what? It's two to the power of two T minus one with the identity matrix. And this T can be very long, right? This can be like hundred. Then you have a v, v of T minus one can be as big as like uh, several like millions or billions of, uh, um, you know, very big value. So that's why we say this can explode even if the V is very small, I mean, small, but still bigger than one. Um, well, is then, what if it's V, uh, these values was not 2.0, but then it was less than 1.0. Then in that case, well, this will just vanish. And that's not too bad. I mean, it's not, at least it's not gonna hurt your model training because it's not, it's, it will be just zero. So it will just, it just be ignored during training, but, of course, maybe that's not desired, but still it's not gonna, you know, just screw up your training. But if this explodes, then it's gonna screw up your training. And, and but actually bigger problem actually is that, uh, of course, this will still be equivalent to a single linear layer. And you will have to prove this in your assignment one. So basically you're not really doing anything special if you do this. Um, anything more special than basically multi-layer perceptron. So that's why we need activation for these two problems, not just across the layers, the hierarchical layers, but across time. So which one should we use activation? So we talk about sigmoid 10 H value. And well, I, I'm, I, can, I, I don't wanna say that actually other things can, cannot be used. I mean, sigmoid can be used, 10 H can be used, ReLU is a bit tricky because of the recurrent relationship. It will not actually solve the exploding value problem. So I will not recommend ReLU in recurrent neural net. Although there were actually several tries trying to use ReLU because ReLU is very good for, um, I would say they actually don't have uh, the diminishing gradient. So it's very, it's very convenient for training, but um, so I, I will not say it's impossible, I will say, um, maybe, but probably not an obvious choice in general. But, and I will say 10H is more obvious choice because this is signed, which means you can also model negative numbers. Sigmoid cannot have negative outputs. So 10H is usually the answer for RNNs. So what that means is then um, HT will be, you just apply this 10H to, to the um, V of HT minus one plus UX, XT. 
And of course, I told you that you can put bias here too. Okay, so that is this is the definition uh, of RNN when people say vanilla RNN. So that's important to know because um, usually when people say vanilla RNN, they usually don't mean this. This is a probably, I mean, this is recurrent, but uh, you will see in your assignment that this doesn't really make any difference from the uh, multi-layer perceptron. Um, Okay, so this is definition of vanilla RNN in most cases, okay? Okay, so putting everything together. And we uh, note that since we want to train inference in batch, we need to actually put one more dimension in the beginning. So this is called batch size. So let's say B equal batch size, N equal vocab size, L equal to sequence length, and D is a hidden state size. We just uh, have the same number for every layers. Then we'll have a uh, input of vocab IDs, which is um, B and L, right? So B, because B is a batch size and L is the sequence length, and each value actually is corresponding to uh, vocab IDs, right? So hopefully, let me know if you're confused about this. This will be the input. And the embedding matrix will be n, n comma d because you have uh, n words and you have a d dimension for each word. And so let's say that input here is x. And so x is, in other words, um, matrix of size b times l. And then suppose that embedding matrix is e, and this is size of n times d. And of course, we saw that if you're actually using embedding matrix, then it's better to actually index or just retrieve the one hot. I mean, instead of uh, doing the matrix multiplication, you can just index it. That's more efficient. But for the mathematical notation, I'll just use matrix multiplication. Then the what RNN equation will be basically is that we define the HT to be what? Um, 10 H of, uh, yeah, 10 H of, uh, you multiply V to the previous H T minus one, um, plus we used U, but, um, I'll say, I'm going to do this just to avoid confusion. You can apply U to the, um, wait, sorry. Um, well, the X is actually uh, vocab IDs. They are not um, one half vectors. You have to translate this one to, uh, to one half vectors and up, up, uh, multiply to embeddings. But that's a bit tricky. So I'll just, I mean, tricky to actually put in the notations. So I'll just say, uh, this is just I, and I'll say X is, you just apply this embedding, embedding matrix to the inputs. So this will be what? You have batch size and you have a length and and you have a dimension, right? And you basically do you multiply u to this x and plus b. And you might wonder what does it mean to actually multiply a matrix to a 3D tensor? Because x here is 3D tensor. So you can think of B as something that you can just ignore. So in reality, what happens is that, um, how should I say this? Well, actually, so one more um, mistake I made is that actually you will be applied um, in this case because of the dimension how X is written. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I think I wrote this, you know, yeah, yeah. I think you're, uh, what you said is right. Yeah, V is a learnable matrix. Yeah, V is a learnable matrix. But I, I, I wrote the notation of it in a very a bad way. So um, I'll say this way. So, so how we write this is a bit tricky when we operate in the matrix level and in the uh, vector level. So um, 
we're given this x uh, matrix x right but then if we actually split this by uh, per vector then this will become what you have x t t is operating on the the l and this is a uh, size of uh, just um what is it so this will be just size of a uh, b times d right at, at, at the time step t <clears throat> and um well actually it's, it's a very confusing notation i'm sorry actually so I, it's more accurate to say actually just rd then it's it's correct to say that in this case then you are applying u to the xt but then what i want to say is that in reality we're writing this as an equation of uh, vectors and matrix but in PyTorch, we will see actually in today's tutorial soon, what's really uh, more convenient, actually more parallelizable is that you actually define HT in batch. And when you're doing this in batch, then it's actually makes more sense to actually do um, the other way. V is actually being applied to the, um, at the end, I mean, at the, after the H instead of before, before H, so V was here, but now it comes here. And again, um, X is here. And U is here. And here, uh, it's just B. So we'll actually get to get back to this, how these like, why these notations are really complex when we're doing the, uh, a bit of PyTorch tutorial. I think for those of you who are familiar with it, probably understand what I'm talking about. We'll get back to that. So we're going to have a short five minute break until 446 and then come back to it. And we're going to actually now cover a bit of uh, details about the assignment. See you soon.
Okay, welcome back. So now let's uh, take a look into the assignment one. So the assignment one will have a few math questions, okay? Not just coding, but also math questions. And you'll be asked to implement a text classifier with MLP and RNNs. Actually, it's not very similar, but um, I'm gonna just use the, uh, the, the assignment for the tutorial. And you will try to improve it with the following variations, which will cover this class, which is a gating mechanism, um, pre-trained word embedding, not this class actually, dropout and pulling. Actually, you're not gonna use this either. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the assignment in case you haven't seen it yet. And I'm gonna actually go over really quickly how it's structured. Okay, so as you see, the assignment one, uh, T in charge is Myung. So please, uh, for for uh, logistical questions, please um, ask Myung. But then um, I think I forgot to tell you this. Actually, uh, one important announcement is that please make sure to actually put your um, student IDs, um, especially when you're submitting your quiz, before you submit the quiz, because your student IDs uh, or and also names will be used to find you on the uh, attendance sheet. And also, when, when you have questions, assignment questions, please use the GitHub Q&As if possible. So unless the question is private, you will have to use GitHub Q&As. So we'll actually direct you to use uh, GitHub Q&As if your question is deemed to be not private. Um, it's due on September 29th, 11 p.m. Wednesday. And um, so for Kai students, you will submit your assignment through the KLMS. And you're gonna basically what? Uh, upload a PDF of this notebook. So what, how you do that, just go to file and print PDF. It's okay if the code is, you know, cut. The purpose of PDF is more of a whether your PDF version matches your um, link, which might change in the middle. It's really hard to check. And also a link to the collab. That's actually exactly, uh, the original version of the PDF. You, it's okay also to submit the uh, IPI MB file, but then I highly encourage you to work on Colab because anyways, it will be doable on Colab, these uh, assignments are. And uh, use inline LaTeX for mathematical expressions. Uh, you will see how that works. And grading, the entire assignment will be out of 20 points. Oh, crap. And um, you can obtain up to five bonus points. So max score is 25 points. For every late day, your grade will be deducted by two points. And you can use only uh, one of your late, late days. We have seven days in total, so uh, please be wise. There was a question from Mario. Is the IPine I notebook file to be submitted in place of PDF or the collab link? It's for the, uh, in place of collab link, actually. Um, so what that means is you will need to submit PDF um, in both cases. Okay. And one really important thing is that you'll receive a grade of zero if you submit after seven days. That's because we're gonna release the rubric and the answers after exactly seven days. And apparently once we have released the answers, it's not clear if you have just copied the answers or you wrote yourself. So. Um, be, please make sure to submit before seven days. So it's not 30% if you submit after seven days, it's actually zero. Um, you will use Python 3.7 and PyTorch 1.9, which is already available in Colab by default. And yeah, please take a look at that. But I'm gonna go actually into the number three because uh, for the PyTorch. And Here's what I'm talking about. So take a look at this. So we define input IDs to be basically um, just the uh, map the dictionary, the word to ID, word to ID basically maps the word to some number and for the every word in the um, input tokens. Here input tokens will be high in world. So there'll be two, two words and high actually maps to 
uh, the first token, the world maps to the second token, input ID of one and two. And then um, you actually make this into fixed length by padding or truncating. So here you pad, right? Pad tokens. And you're here, you truncate if it's longer. So this guarantees input IDs to be always length of what? The length, which is length is eight. And then you make this into torch tensor. And if you print it, then you will see that this is a length eight tensor with the input ID one, two, and all zeros. Here zero is pad. Uh, that's how we just defined it here to be. Right, so, okay. So there was a question from Kaktoi Ding. Can I make a link to my notebook on my server at Kaist instead of G, uh, GG Collab? Yeah, that's fine too. Actually, that would be more preferred in fact than submitting IPI notebook file. But I guess in that case, then it has to be, um, I mean, um, it would be good to be runnable. Otherwise you, it's better to just submit by a file, right? So yeah, but definitely, yeah. Google Colab, your own notebook, server link or file, or three are fine. Um, so the question from Soro is that in the assignment, what should be the sequent length? There is no answer. So that's like a hyperparameter you want to tune. And you know, you don't want to make it too short, but you don't want to make it too long because it's going to take too much time. So it's not, there is no uh, single right answer. You choose it. But I can say the 80 is probably too short. Something like 32 probably is a good number. Yeah. Okay. So, and then here, so then you see the input tensors dimension is um, one by what? Eight. So why, where is one coming from? Well, the one is actually coming from this bracket here. Why, why we put bracket here is because we have to actually have batch size. So we want to account for the mini batch size. That's why we have a one additional dimension. And then we have a baseline here, which is just multi-layer perceptron. So actually I have one um, mistake here. So it's actually no. So this is not average pulling actually. It's just a one layer um, classification. And it's not actually one layer, sorry, two layer. Okay, so you first do the embedding. So what happens if you do embedding? Um, so then you basically map these input IDs to um, the each, each input ID corresponds to a vector, the word embedding. And the layer will be, first layer will be just linear. And then second layer, it will be for the classification. And then basically you see that when the input tensor comes in, you apply your embedding, then this becomes best size length and B. And you flatten it because you're making this MLP. So you batch size and length times D, right? And then you basically, um, map this into what? First layer with the first layer, which then will translate best size length times D to um, D. And then that layer, that that um, hidden state will be mapped to two, which is the output dimensions, the number of uh, output classes. That's what happens here. And I just return logits. And you see that I return logits instead of probability here because when you're training, it's actually more stable. Um, we'll see here in the, uh, to use logics directly, then actually compute the probability and then compute the uh, cross entropy. You will actually um, see that this is equivalent to cross entropy and the probability will, the probability of the correct answer will be equivalent. That will be part of your assignment as well as why we want to do but we want to use logits instead of the probability that you compute here after softmax. That'll be also a part of your assignments. But you can still output the probability and you see that, uh, of course, it's not trained at all. So it's some garbage number 0.3 and 0.7. But what that means is that it's 0.3 likely that the label is uh, the first class and the uh, 0.7, which is basically very negative review. This is a, a Stanford sentiment tree bank, which is 
review of either positive or negative, and you want to basically make it either um, negative being zero and positive being one. Well, I mean, negative being the index zero and positive being index one, sorry. And then you can just compute the loss by just defining um, the CEL between the logits and label. Here are the, the, the first sentence, hello world, hi world, probably, I just label it to be one instead of zero. It means it's positive, hi world is positive. And then once you have defined your loss, then you basically just optimize it with your uh, stochastic gradient descent optimizer with all the parameters in this model with some learning rates. And then you just did zero grad. So that we, you basically this is a resetting process that just removes all the gradients in the uh, tensors um, because they actually accumulate gradients when you compute the gradients. Hopefully you know these things from um, previous or other um, classes that you learned PyTorch. Okay, there's a question from Sarah. So I have checked that the data set, the labels are decimal values. So how can we define the classes? So I said that I think in the, um, um, where is it here? So you, you, I wrote it here. Oh, sorry. So you, you see this? So each label is scored between zero and one. You round it to either zero or one for binary classifications, positive for one and negative to four zero. So that, that means if it's below 0 0.5, then um, it should be zero. And if it's above 0 0.5, then it should be one. Is that clear? Okay. Okay, then lastly, you basically do the backward, which is compute the gradient and optimizer that step actually update the parameters then you can actually also see that all the gradients actually still reside in these parameters. So you, that's why you have to actually zero it after you train it every time, okay? And we just did that for, this is just MLP, multi-layer perceptron example. And we want to use recurrent neural network to replace this MLP. And in that case, you will have outputs for each time step and you want to use the output from the last time step for your, your model's final classification output, okay? That's what you want to do. All right, so hopefully, um, maybe I can be a bit more explicit about what I meant by the last time step. So um, I'm going to share the um, screen again. I mean, the my slides. Okay, so now speaking of the PyTorch, so now we see that the um, input IDs will be size of what? Batch size and length, right? And then once you pass the embedding, the inputs will be size of B of L, B comma L comma D. And what we want to do is we basically want to apply the recurrent relationship for every um, time step. So we're calling this X, okay? And then we know that, uh, we know this relationship, which is HT is equal to 10H of uh, um, V of HT minus one plus U of XT. But I told you that this, Multiplying the matrices V and, okay, there's another question. Um, I'll answer that soon after this. Um, so then this is only because the HT minus one XT are vectors, but then we are now all operating in the matrix space because of the batch size. So what that means is actually now XT is actually size of what? Not just D, but B and D. And then if you apply the transformation to these matrices, you want to put this actually after the uh, matrix, the, I mean, XT or HT, because now the vectors are no more 
uh, XT or VT are no more column vectors, but they're actually matrix. So that's why we apply um, V and U after H and X. So if you do this in the best, uh, best form, then this will be 10 H of H T minus one V plus X T and U. Okay. And HT minus one, the size will be B of B comma D. And what is V? What is V? It's just D comma D, right? And XT is um, B comma D and U is just D comma D. So they basically just cancel out and still, be, still maintain the same size, which is why HT will be the same dimension as the HT minus one. And you're going to apply this to the every time step. Then you will basically end up with um, HT of size B of D for every time step. And you want to use the HT, which is the, the I mean, well, well, to be more exact, actually, this is L, right? Um, I'm using like probably different notations. A L is like the last token in the input. And you want to use the HL as the, um, this is also, of course, size of B comma D. And you want to map this into what? Two classes. So you want to apply a matrix of D comma two. This will be your um, second layer. Your first layer was this recurrent relationship of V and V, but then now your second layer will be D comma two. That's the only difference between the multi-layer perceptron example I just show you in the, on the collab versus what I'm showing you here. And then this will be logits. And if you apply softmax, then it will be your probability. If you use this into the cross entropy loss, then it will be your loss. Okay. And um, probably I'm, I'm not going to be able to cover everything today, but I'll try to actually at least motivate why we need uh, something called LSTM. So, um, but then still this has some issues. What, what is it? Oh, actually, I'll come back to your question now. And, okay, what is, so uh, cock 20 asked the question, what is dev data? I only see train validation and test section. So validation is dev data. They're the same thing. Clear? Okay, and then the second question was, should lowercase function be applied for vocab? Yes, maybe I wasn't explicit about that, but I highly recommend you, but I didn't put it explicitly one reason is that it's design choice more of than something that's always the right thing to do. In this case, probably you want to lowercase for the vocab. And also, of course, when you lowercase your vocab, then you want to also lowercase when you are tokenizing your input. Okay, so that's good. So, but then there's one critical problem here. What is it? The fact that the RNNs actually change the entire hidden state at every time step, which means that it is very difficult to conserve information from long distance. Suppose that you found a really important information at time step five, and then you want to utilize this at time step 12. Then it has to go through seven steps of linear transformation followed by activation function. It's very unlikely that that information will be not corrupted because the RNN actually changes the entire hidden state for every time step. So the really important question here is that how can we pass information from long distance without significantly corrupting it? So there are several mechanisms for, uh, for this. One is gating mechanism, which I'm gonna talk about in the next slide. Spoiler is LSTM or GRU. Number two is attention mechanism, which is I'm gonna talk, which I'm gonna talk about probably in the next few in a future lecture very soon, which is also actually the building block for the transformer. Very important. And number three, uh, we can also pull. I actually have this slide, but then probably we cannot cover that. We don't have time for that. Um, number four is that a residual connection, which is actually quite simple. Not it's not used often in the RNNs, but then what it does is that um, you just add it. So um, we have this relationship, right? 
when you have this H1, H2, but H2 is dependent on X1 uh, after two layers right here. But then if you actually just define your new H2 to be just H1 plus H2, then it only has to go through one layer. Well, I mean, sorry. So I'll not say the layer, but then you get the point that if you just add everything, everything from the previous hidden states, then you will not have to go through that recurrent relationship to be dependent on the previous inputs or previous hidden states, right? Just addition. Addition is called residual connection. So it's very, um, I mean, addition, adding the input and output of certain layer. So it, adding the input to the its output is called residual connection. It's a very fancy name for a simple thing. And it's very useful in many cases, especially um, deep hierarchical network. They always usually have residual connection, but uh, it's very rare that you have this such thing in the uh, time axis. Um, so another problem with this RNNs is actually that the gradient explodes or vanishes. And it's really important to note that this is not about the value being exploded. We saw it's, it's actually easy to prove that because of 10H, you will always have a, a zero between negative one and one, your outputs. So it's never going to be explode the, exploding the values, but it can actually explode the gradients. And you're going to actually see that you will actually be asked to prove this in your assignment. <clears throat> so, or you can also vanish, which means it will be zeroed. And that's actually a really significant problem too, because if you, or a gradient becomes zero, then you will not be able to update your model with respect to whatever has happened in the past, because the gradient doesn't exist at all, right? So you can mitigate the exploding gradient using um, gradient clipping. And gradient clipping is just, I'm gonna talk about in the next slide. And you can also mitigate vanishing gradients using gating me mechanisms. So um, there are two mechanisms for these two phenomena. Phenomena, like one is exploding, one is vanishing. Exploding can be you know, mitigated with gradient clipping and vanishing can be also mitigated with gating mechanism. Um, and gating mechanism is employed in LSTM GRU. So what is gradient clipping? It's very simple. You just have a gradient Maybe if it's too large, then you basically just normalize it and then just have some multiple to it, C. So in that sense, then what it does is basically if the gradient is too large, bigger than C, then it makes it smaller than C. Of course, this only gets applied um, when the gradient is bigger than C. Um, so there was a question, if they are fundamentally, fundamentally dealing with the same problem, Um, propagating information across multiple layers and gradients. How was your guess as to why residual connections are less used for the time axis? Okay. That's a very good question. I think it's more of a historical reason. Well, the fact that the attention mechanism actually replaces residual function, the, the residual, what residual does. So what, when I said it's less used, I'm not saying it doesn't work. It's more of a People haven't used it a lot. Number two is that in, uh, in that case, then you're adding um, basically, you know, across all time steps and that addition will be too large, maybe, right? Um, so you cannot just do residual connection for every layer or you can only do basically previous layers where there's no connection, not the a layer from the long distance. But then I cannot say it doesn't work so I'm not saying it's, it doesn't work, yeah. So maybe it's good at some cases. Historically though, I think maybe it's because also that at the time when the residual connection gained a lot of popularity in image, um, which is around like 2015, 2016. Um, and then when it started to probably come into NLP, people kind of switched to transformer very soon. And also attention mechanism kind of did it for you. So I think there, there are two, I think there are two actually same thing, but <clears throat> the short answer is that I think attention is very powerful that in many cases, residual connection is not 
adding much value to it in sequential time axis. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna touch really a little bit about LSTM. So basically LSTM is designed to resolve these issues. So what, which issues? Um, the um, exploding or vanishing gradient problem and also long-term dependency, because uh, I talk about gating mechanism here too, right? So what is gating mechanism exactly? So why I'm talking about LSTM and gating mechanism. So LSTM is an example of using gating mechanism. So probably we should say that um, LSTM is exactly how you solve these two problems. Gating mechanism is one way to solve these two problems and LSTM is one single most, uh, most famous example probably that utilizes gating mechanism along with the GRU, which is gated recurrent neural network. You see where that the word gated comes from probably, right? So both actually networks use gating. Um, uh, what is gating? Gating is simply creating uh, value between zero and one and then multiplying that and also uh, to the whatever you would have multiplied without it. So here, so consider, so this F, I, O, C, T, these values, this would be all between zero, zero to one. Of course, these are vectors, not scalar values. So they are, the, those values are, there are several values. They're basically, they're vectors of zero, between zero to one, but then you can think of a scalar for now. Um, so then if it's scalar, then you basically have a value of a 0 0.3, 0 0.7, et cetera, right? And suppose that, suppose for instance, FT is what? Um, suppose this is 0 0.1, okay? And suppose that IT is uh, 0 0.8. Then what that means is that when you're computing this CT, CT can be considered as uh, something similar to hidden state, but actually in LSTM, there are two hidden states. One is HT, the main hidden state, and CT is uh, the memory, what they call, but it's just a second hidden state you can think of. It's long-term long -term memory. And see that, so FT is 0.1. That means that it will almost ignore whatever the CT minus one was, because you're multiplying a small number to the previous memory state, right? And IT is the current hidden, current memory state candidate. And IT is quite big, 0 0.8. So it's kind of conserving whatever was newly initialized in this time step. So if you have a small FT and big IT, then your CT will be mostly dependent on your current candidate. But what if it's the other way? If the FT is really big and IT is small, I mean, big being close to one, then you will almost ignore the current input or I mean current memory state, and you'll only use the previous <coughs> um, time, time steps memory state. And if the if you have a forget, this F is forget gate actually, if you have your forget gate is very uh, close to 1.0 for many consecutive time steps, then now you see that you're able to conserve whatever the memory state was from very long distance to the current time step without corrupting it much. Maybe it corrupts it by just, you know, decreasing its amplitude or the, the norm by a bit, but no, not much change, not as much as change the RNN that applies the linear transformation, right? So that's where this, the concept of memory comes in, that the fact that your memory is conveyed from long distance, if you have a high forget gate value, it's a, a bit confusing because forget gate here is, you're forgetting it if its value is small, not the other way. So forget gate being high value means that you do not forget. A bit confusing, but... So I think it's more accurate to say it's more of a conserva cons cons conservation gate because you're actually measuring the conservation, not the other way. But anyways, and then you just basically have a hidden state that depends on just this memory state with some another uh, output gate here. So I think people have different um, explanations for this 
um, depends, but I think it's not super important. What really is important is this recurrent relationship between CT and CT minus one. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. I'm a bit over today. So hopefully now this will, I think, give you um, enough knowledge to start assignment one. There is a bit remaining, but we can cover that on Wednesday. So good luck with your assignments and see you on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Okay, there was one question from Hangi. So why why they did not make FT and IT sums up to one? Um, yeah, I think that's a valid, very uh, good question. And I don't know. I mean, of course, there is a, you might want to add both things because you might want to keep both sometimes. So you might not want to always have a zero sum gate values, but it's also kind of weird that it's, uh, you have a, it, when, if you call gating, then you will have to pass something. You will have to forget something at the same time. So it makes, it might more, it makes more sense to actually do one minus FT. That's what I think what you meant. And I, I, it's actually what the uh, other gating mechanisms usually do. So what you actually suggested is not entirely, um, I think it's not actually, it's very valid point, but they did it for some reason. And I think in empirically it works better too, in general. Not by much though. Okay, thanks everyone.